So the presenter for this topic is Jeff Pan, and he is the director of engineering at Granberry Solutions, as you can see here. And uh, today he's going to be sharing with us a solution, Granberry Solution developed to automatically test restaurants' point of sale. So when we go to the restaurant, we always take it for granted that the payment processing will just work. But in reality, a lot of effort goes behind the scenes to make that possible. And before he starts, uh, please turn your your cell phone into silent or vibration mode so that the, the presenter doesn't get interrupted. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Can everybody hear me? All right, cool. Um, well, uh, as he said, my name is Jeff. I work for Granberry Solutions. You may not have heard of us. Uh, we're very obscure. You may not have heard of us. Um, we make specialized uh, point of sale software for restaurants, mainly pizzerias, because it's a very weird problem compared to normal, pizza, compared to normal point of sale. We also make a lot of software for wineries, tasting rooms, stuff like that. So um, what you should find refreshing is I am not a consultant, right? Um, I don't have a pet open source project I'm here to evangelize. I uh, don't have a book I'm selling. Well, actually I do, but it's about vampires in love, so <laughs> not relevant for this talk. Um, the reason that I'm here is because you know, we had a really unusual problem that Stack Overflow couldn't help us solve, right? We had to kind of invent our own wheels, so to speak. Um, and oftentimes at a conference like this, you go from talk to talk to talk and everyone says, if you just embrace this idea, this concept, this technology, you go back to your company and the culture's gonna change, the technology's gonna change, the omelets in the cafeteria are gonna be more fluffy and delightful, right? So um, I wanted to just share like a real war story of a real world problem and how we solved it. So like I said, this is a war story. Um, I'll summarize the problem briefly, which is we, had a, we, we built a, uh, a web-based LAMP stack point of sale system for restaurants a long, long time ago and needed to modernize it. So we had to essentially build a comparative testing platform that could compare an old system to a new system. And, and to do that, we weren't gonna be, we're, we were gonna need some kind of an abstraction layer that separates the actual Selenium code that's making the browser do stuff from the business rules and the pricing logic that we're trying to test. And so we needed real architecture. We couldn't just you know, start banging out JUnit test cases and coming up with you know, crazy Godzilla XPath expressions just to make it work just this once, please, right? We, we had to be a little bit more deliberate about it, but we also had to be practical. The reason we did not open source the project is because we felt like that would have driven us up into the ivory tower, right? We would have been focused more on trying to win the approval of our nerdly peers than actually uh, delivering the test automation that we needed. We also stuck in the Java ecosystem. I know that, because uh, uh, that's kind of the direction that we're going. I know that Rails and Node are, are all the rage these days, but we've decided to kind of hide in our Java-based bunker and let them kill each other, and then we'll come up and rebuild civilization on the ashes, right? So, and, and, but, but because we knew we were going to be building stuff that was somewhat proprietary, we wanted the rest of the, ta the stack to be really non-controversial, very simple. No one's going to get upset about Spring and JUnit and Selenium and Bamboo and Jenkins, right? Um, they're pretty boring choices. So that's what the rest of the stack looks like. And this is our battlefield, right? So most of you are used to building web applications where the server, the physical server is the last thing you're worried about. It's in some, it's in some beautiful data center that's concrete and it's full of nice cold fans and physical security isn't even the issue. Um, but this is where our servers live, right? Um, we do our best to, in, to inspire our customers to protect them physically, locked offices, locked cabinets, but sometimes they're just shoved underneath counters. Um, this picture right here, as a matter of fact, was taken at By Design Pizza. If you guys know where IKEA is near the airport here in Portland, uh, that's, that's a real world installation of our system. I'm not telling you where they put their server, but it's pretty good, so be cool there. But it's not uncommon at all for a server to fail in the field because the CPU fan is full of flour, right? And the last time they made dough. It's a really interesting environment to try and, and, and harden. It's almost like a military type of thing because you have to deal with these uh, environmental factors. So let me talk about the old system. Looks pretty cool, doesn't it? It's pretty awesome. But um, so uh, two people based right here in Portland named Duessa and Brian started a company called Firefly many, many years ago and they built this, uh, the first uh, Linux-based, uh, LAMP stack-based point of sale system for restaurants and they specialized in pizza. And yes, it shows, it doesn't look like much these days, but if you have ordered pizza in America more than two or three times in your lifetime, you, one of your orders went through this system, right? But uh, it, even though it served us well, it had to be replaced. We needed to build a new, modern, more viable platform. 
And the really, I mean, I've read a lot of Joel on software, and I know you're never supposed to rewrite anything. And so it's very scary when you contemplate a rewrite, and that's because developer, developers are optimists. Uh, when a product is mature, what that means is the developers have had all their optimism beaten out of them, right? That's what a mature system is. Right, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to take important requirements. Like in the pizza business, you get coupons in the mail every day. All these weird coupons, we have to model all that in our software. Make sure the interactions work correctly. Make sure that all that works. It's crazy, right? It's, it is awash in edge cases. And so that's the risk when you rewrite something is the edge cases get dropped on the floor. So we wanted to build a test platform that could essentially go back 15 years in time and put a layer of test automation on top of the old system and then compare the logic between that system and the new system. So if I ring up a pizza in system A and system B, it all works the exact same way. And it was also going to be an incremental rewrite, meaning that we were going to build this new system on top of the old system so that we could ship something a little bit sooner than going off into a cave for two years to build a new system and hope it all works out in the end, right? And we also have to deal with um, integration peers. Um, uh, ordering food online is something that's talked about a lot. There's a lot of startups in this space, but people really do order pizza on their phones and order the pizza online every day. It happens. It's a real high volume thing. And so we, we, we don't want to just test um, the point of sale itself, but how it interacts with online ordering platforms, that kind of thing. So that was the goal. And so this was the plan, right? We, de we decided to develop a cross-browser, a cross-product testing tool, not a cross-browser testing tool. And we had to have an abstraction layer. So we have to model the workflow, all of the, the buttons I'm pressing, the, the logic in something other than uh, the Selenium code, which is tied to the underlying document object model of the application. We have to, it could be totally different. So we decided to use, to model that in hipster-friendly JSON. So the person in your office with the most ironic mustache could still be a part of it and enjoy it. It'd be awesome. Um, another reason that we wanted to do this is because we wanted to reduce friction in the time. The reason that I hate XPath is because it makes it hard to develop tests. And if you want to get lots of test coverage, you have got to grease the wheels. You've got to make it easy to make new tests. And in our world, you might think, oh, what's so hard about it, right? You go up to a terminal, you start pressing buttons, you ring up the order, you take their money, that's it, right? And in a sense, yes, uh, because it is a repetitive order entry process all day, every day. But the, it can be set up tens of thousands of different ways. There are so many edge cases and permutations that you know, a Cartesian product doesn't even capture the scale of it, right? It's crazy. So we wanted it to be easy to take a little snippet of JSON that models the test case, tweak it a little bit, and now I've got my edge case. And, and that person who did that did not have to be an SDET or an SQE. They can be a relatively non-technical person, right? And of course, we had to integrate all the things. And we wanted this to um, work in a CI process where we're not using a, a headless process like PhantomJS. We're using real browser automation. We have, we have a browser farm in Dallas that has a Linux box and a Mac and a Windows machine, and they run the real tests on the real browsers, right? So that's how this works. And um, there was resistance to this at first, right? Um, they said, when we first talked about doing this, the, the main arguments were, this is really complicated. Remember what I told you before about all the edge cases? They said, that's the reason you can't do this, right? This is going to take too long. It's going to be too hard. You'll never be able to manage it. Now, in my view, that argument is an argument in favor of doing it, because what you're really saying is this is the risk of rewriting everything. The testing risk is almost a side issue, right? If you're going to ship it, you've got to test it. So we, if that risk is something we can't bite off, then let's, not, let's just not build it in the first place, right? So I think that argument gets dismissed. The next set of arguments are the ones that really bum me out, which is sometimes people in charge have a tendency to think that quality is somehow a a side thing. It's like a burden. They don't believe in it. They don't invest in it. And they have the nerve to say things like, you can't waste real engineers on QA, right? That kind of thing, that, that's very upsetting to me. It hurts my, it hurts my heart when I hear that, right? Um, because, uh, you know, test engineers are real engineers, right? Uh, and they have to have this sort of parity with each other. And so part of the way that, one of the things that we did to try and and sort of explain this trade-off to those in charge was to say, it was to go all the way back to 1979 to Mr. Philip Crosby. If you make your living in QA, I'm sure you've already read this book. If not, if people have not read this book, it is, you, your time is better spent just going to PALS right now and getting it than listening to the rest of my talk. Just go read this book, okay? Um, so, and, you'll see, and when you read a modern book on QA, they'll reference this book a lot, uh, Philip Crosby. So, but one of the, the most compelling arguments he makes is that the cost of shipping mistakes and then having 
support people, RMAs, fix them after the fact, that's 20% of your revenue. So if you're a $100 million company, you spend $20 million a year fixing your mistakes after the fact, where it would otherwise would cost you 2.5% of your revenue just to prevent them in the first place, right? So that's the investment here. It's quality is free because if you, um, if you, if you take, the time to, to take the time to actually build a real durable quality program, then uh, you ship good stuff and you don't spend all your time fixing the mistakes and looking like an idiot in front of your customers, right? That's what we're trying to avoid. So I can stop there. All right, now, because we did choose Java as our language here, we've got to have lots of unnecessary layers. It's really important, right? Got to have that, okay? And we even made them different colors to further enhance your experience today. But let's walk down. This is what our, our, our system looks like. Um, we start with the JSON, the JSON test scenarios. It's just JSON, pretty human readable. Um, I, I wouldn't go quite so far. We're not trying to, um, to adhere to some formal definition of behavioral driven development. Where it's very purpose built, but it's similar to that. We also have a configuration element, which is just, you know, where's the server I'm going to test? You know, if I'm integrating with an online ordering system, where is it? What are my credentials? That kind of stuff. And then the actual runtime for the test, it's just JUnit. It, it, this whole thing runs just like any other JUnit test suite would run. Nothing crazy there. We use Jackson, another super controversial choice in the Java world, to parse the JSON, turn it into POJOs, which stands, which stands for plain old Java objects if you're not from the Java world. And then um, the, the purpose of these test scenarios is to be product agnostic, product neutral, but at some point you have to pick, right? And that's the job of the product driver. Its job is to say, hey, this command actually is implemented uh, for Thrive, our new product, with this specific command handler. And so the command handlers are where all of the, um, all of the real kind of selenium, the, the stuff you're used to seeing on a test automation platform lives. And then of course, we use another controversial original idea called the page object to, uh, to model the, the, the UI components. And that's something that all of you who are SQEs or SDETs already know about, right? Um, we also uh, have a couple of simulation tools that help us do things. So not only do our command handlers talk to page objects, and this is most of what happens, but there are also some REST clients that deal with some simulation tools we use, like for simulating printers and cache drawers and things like that. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of work down the stack so you can kind of see a for instance of each of these layers. Um, let's talk briefly about Spring. Who knows about Spring already? Right? OK. Well, if you don't know about Spring, it basically has become like the Yamaha of Java software. They make, uh, they make industrial cranes and pianos and guitars and stuff. It's, it, it used to be a very simple dependency injection framework, but now it has become the kitchen sink. Um, I prefer that kitchen sink to the J2EE kitchen sink, but still, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's all over the place. But at its core, what Spring is, is dependency injection. So if you build an object-oriented system, you're going to have a bunch of components, right? These components are going to need to talk to each other and they're going to have to reference each other. And so you end up building this big dependency graph. Now, for a simple dependency graph, that's pretty easy to manage. But if it's a large dependency graph, then you get into issues of when do you initialize which components and all of that. You find yourself implementing your own topographic sort, and it all goes totally crazy. So Spring just handles all that for us. So what we do in Spring is a component gets an annotation. These are called stereotype annotations. These really are used interchangeably. You can do certain things in Spring that make Spring treat these differently from that, but normally we don't really do that. Um, and so you can then use this auto-wired annotation, and what Spring will do is it will load all of these things that have stereotype annotations into essentially an in-memory hash table called the application context. And then it, will, uh, it w then it will look at that when it sees an auto-wired annotation and find another component it already knows about and then wire it in here. And then it will also figure out the sequencing order based on how these auto-wired auto annotations describe a dependency graph, right? Pretty, pretty uh, standard Spring. Okay. All right, and then here's our really, really hard to implement JUnit test case. So every test case has an actual JUnit test case and a corresponding um, JSON file, or possibly more than one. And as you can see, it's really just a simple mapping here. We could have come up with something a little cooler for this, maybe a, maybe a directory full of JSON files that we just scan or something, but we just didn't. So uh, we have this Crossfire test support base class, and all you do is basically tell it, hey, I want you to run the normal test stuff with these JSON files. Pretty simple. And then here's what an actual JSON scenario file looks like. Again, very complicated. It has a name and some commands, and the commands is an array of just commands. And those commands get serialized or deserialized as POJOs. We parse them, right? This example is 
the login command. It, it, remember, there's nothing here that, that specif that's specific to the underlying product. We're not referencing any DOM elements, any CSS elements. It's very, very generic. We're telling it to log in. Here's the login ID. Do you expect it to succeed? And a few other things that are relevant to our product. Let's, let's look at another command. This one might, might be a little easier to understand. This is the menu item select command. Its job is to order a cheese pizza, right? So even though there's nothing DOM specific here, it, it will iterate over the buttons on a touch screen terminal. It will find the button that says cheese, cheese pizza on it, press it, and then we expect the price to be $7 and the expected total to be $5.30. Huh, that's crazy. Why would that be? The answer is automatic discounts, yet another edge case that we're talking about. So this is an example of what a command will look like. Now, um, most of this stuff is really just dependent on what the command needs to do. The only part of this, of any command that has to be kind of consistent from command to command, is the top line itself, because we use uh, this unique string to essentially tell the parser, if you see JSON that looks like this, that has that command, then this is the Java class you actually use to serialize it, or to deserialize it, right? All right, and so here's an example of a command class. It looks a lot like a POJO, but it's a little bit different in that it does, it does implement an interface. All that interface basically says is, hey, this, this, this getter has to exist, right? And then you give it a component annotation, and that's used to kind of help the parser. It's a bit of a hack, really. This is not so much a brag as a confession, this particular slide. So. Um, and then we parse commands using the Jackson deserializer. Um, we don't really do a whole lot of extra special stuff to it other than one little hack which is we have to, because the JSON itself doesn't have anything in it that identifies the Java class we're going to turn it into, we have to kind of provide that. We have to boost it. So all we basically do is, is uh, we could have done this with auto-wired, um, but all we're doing is inside the deserializer, we put together an in-memory map of all of the commands in the system keyed by their names. And all we do is look those keys up when we parse the JSON, right? So this is an example of how we call the parser. That's pretty... Uh, Pretty standard stuff. The only thing that would be different from your standard how to use Jackson and Stack Overflow example is this little bit right here, where we, we add our serializer into the, into the parser. Uh, here's environment configuration. So uh, I mentioned there's a JSON file for how we specify targets and that sort of thing. This is it. It's pretty, it's pretty vanilla. There's no special parsing logic here. What you see is what you get. Uh, there's things like the host name, whether or not to close the browser after a test run. For example, in the CI environment, you don't care if it failed or not, you want to close the browser. Um, but if you're working locally, you might want to keep it open so you can you know, keep inspecting the DOM for the next step or whatever it might be, right? That sort of thing. A um, few more notes on that. Um, that's me fanboying out in an inappropriate way at the Apple campus. Um, so it sets the target host. The main thing I want to, I want to point out is that the, you can change this via the command line. So you can specify a different environment configuration by, by basically passing a command line into the test suite. And so that's how we can tell it, hey, this test run needs to run on Firefox and Chrome and uh, Safari on this machine, where over here it needs to run on Internet Explorer or Chrome or whatever it might be. Right. All right, what's next? And there's the web driver. So, what we're trying to do is we're putting together all the things we're going to need to actually do a test run. Um, any of you who have done non-trivial Selenium stuff have probably already made something that looks kind of like this, right? Um, all we're doing is the target environment says, uh, gives us a, a, basically an array of browsers, and for each test run, the, an enum gets passed in and we do a switch case. Now, our real code's a little more complicated than this because there's profiles we set up and things like that, but that's essentially what's happening. All right. Then there's the product driver. The product driver's uh, job is to take the command that we're running and map it to the product that we're trying to test, right? And so here, it's, it's extremely complicated. We use this loop technology, and we, uh, we, we look at the application context, we find all the product drivers it knows about, and we return the one that matches the product that we're testing. Pretty simple. And then it comes down to this. Now we have the scenario, because we parsed it. We have the web driver, because of our switch case block I showed you. And then we have the, the product driver, and then we basically call execute on it. Now, all execute does, essentially, is delegate to the underlying um, command handlers that we talked about earlier. And here's the interface for a command handler, right? Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, exciting, innovative stuff here. Uh, the command handler basically has two, fun two methods to identify itself. What product is it for? What class is the command? And then there's an execute method that you pass all this stuff into. And here is what uh, uh, the, command, the command handler we talked about earlier actually looks like. So 
Um, we've auto-wired a few things in here. Any ideas what these things we've auto-wired in might be? They're page objects. So we're finally getting to stuff that, that, that's not part of a, an original wheel here. So we start, so the, 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 the command handlers are inside of Spring, they're managed in Spring, and the page objects and other things are wired in as dependencies. And then here's what um, an execute method might look like. This is very simple, this is simplified from the, uh, the example that uh, what the code really looks like. But essentially we're, you know, we're pulling up metadata off the command and we delegate to the select item um, function on the page object and, and that page object knows how to you know, actually look at the DOM and find the button and click it and all of that stuff. And then we have assertions. We don't really have this notion of assertions are one thing and actions are another thing. They're kind of intermingled. And the reason that we do that is because there's a lot of implicit assertions we can do. So um, we were trying to remove effort from the developer. So if the developer shouldn't have to think about, hey, I should verify the price every time. There are things that we can do to, to make that implicit. And so we kind of weave them all in together. So that's an execute method. And that's kind of specific to what we do. Then, of course, just for completeness, to show you that uh, a talk that talks about Selenium WebDriver actually does have some Selenium WebDriver code in it. Here is the page object where we're kind of where we're finally getting to our ubiquitous find elements by stuff, the stuff you're used to with Selenium, right? So that's how we get, that's part one, that's how we get all the way from JSON to WebDriver. And so the JSON that we've created becomes a kind of domain specific language, but that's kind of a stilted term, right? We didn't set out to create our own language. It doesn't have a lexical definition. There's, it's not that formal, but it sort of effectively is that. And so the, the trick of making this all work and the trick that we're going through right now is that you, once you have, you've implemented enough commands and enough command handlers to model everything the system does, then theoretically, uh, most of the testing work at that point is just adding new JSON-based test cases. Now, you'll never get all the way there. You'll be asymptotic with it, ideally, but that's, that's essentially the, the point. Um, and so that's the core architecture. Now, another, another aspect of what we did I want to talk about, and I think this is some of the more fun stuff, honestly, um, is because we make point-of-sale systems, uh, it's not like normal web development where there's just a browser involved and that's all you're dealing with. Um, in this environment, there's, there's printers, there's fingerprint readers, there's cache drawers, all this stuff. How do you test in an automated way all of these things that are physical in nature as opposed to virtual? And so um, I want to talk about a few of those. Um, First of all, credit cards. This is a test card. We don't use real credit cards. All the credit card processors give us test kits. So feel free to run that card. It won't do you any good, right? OK, and so it turns out that testing, a, we want to be able to simulate a credit card swipe. So how do we do that, right? Well, it turns out, for reasons that are, I'm not super in favor of, that, oops, sorry about that, um, that credit card MSRs, the max stripe readers, they just, they're keyboards. As far as the computer is concerned, they're keyboards. This is bad because the vast majority of point of sale hacks are key loggers, and that's why. Because if you swipe a credit card and the MSR is a plain text MSR, you're gonna get track data coming right in just as if someone had typed it, right? So we don't like that. But in order to test this, all we have to do is take an MSR, whether encrypted or unencrypted, hook it up to a text editor and swipe it, right? Then we take what's in that text editor, we put it in a resource file, we can load off the, the class path, and then all we can do, and then we pipe it into send keys, just like any other key, key event in Selenium. So that's how we test uh, magnetic stripe readers. Now, the vast majority of the MSRs that we work with are encrypted. So, and what that means is the MSR itself has a public key in it, and so it, it, it spits out ciphertext, and then you ship that off uh, whole and raw up to the credit card processor where they have the private keys and, and do their work. So that's how you want to do it. Uh, printers. So um, if you ever bought anything in a restaurant, you know they typically give you a lot of unnecessary paperwork uh, as part of the process, right? Not only that, but there's a lot of unnecessary paperwork back in the kitchen. Um, in a really complicated restaurant, pizzas might print on one printer. A grill order, a steak or a burger might print on one printer. There's a fry printer. There could be a salad printer, dessert, the bar. And, and the stuff that goes on the receipts can be, is widely configurable. There's uh, certification rules, the credit card processors that determine a lot of that too. So it's, it's very, very important that we, can't, that we are able to get automation around printing. But um, some crazy ideas were proposed like, hey, let's just put a bunch of printers on a table, get a bunch of webcams, get some OCR software. And like, that was never going to work, right? But what we realized was we don't really have to test whether or not ink goes on paper. What we're testing is our software's interaction with the printers. 
Um, we don't really care if the printer actually prints anything. Um, we just want to make sure that we sent the right thing to the right printer. So what we decided to do was build this thing called Graybox, which is essentially a, uh, a simulation tool that runs alongside the point of sale system in test environments that allows us to kind of uh, simulate these things. So at its core, a printer basically just listens on a port, if it's a network printer, which most of ours are, it just listens on a port and uh, some external process, a, a spooler, a print queue, cups, whatever it might be, just dumps, uh, dumps a job on the port. And these printer jobs typically are text. They're semi-human readable, uh, especially in the kind of printer languages that are used by these printers. And so all we have to do is create a process that just listens on a bunch of sockets, simulating a network of printers. And then instead of printing something, it just throws it in a cache where a REST API can be used to basically ask the system, hey, what was the last job that went to this printer? Can you give it to me? I'll run a regex on it and make sure it is exactly what I thought it was supposed to be. So that's how we do it, right? And it actually works, right, Nate? Okay, good. Okay. I have a sure. We do in we have an integration testing phase that we do. We do a real hardware integration test, but in the like so the, the test that we run every night, right, right. No, that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 sure yeah. We do manually test everything that involves hardware integration, but um, but we want to be able to have a lot more test coverage than we can get with that. So we, we do this. Um, cache drawers are similar because we have to make sure that cache drawers open when they're supposed to and they don't open when they're not supposed to. That's pretty important. I'm going to teach you how to rob a restaurant today. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. Um, it turns out this is the easy problem because uh, cache drawers are typically connected to the printers. If you go and if you look at the kind of receipt printer that we use in this world, you'll see a little uh, connector on the back of the printer that's labeled DK usually for drawer kick. And all you need is a little cable that connects that to that. And then we open the printer by sending a special control code to the printer, which is just like a print job, no different. And then the drawer opens. So if you get yourself one of these cables and a 24 volt battery, you can rob any restaurant you want, right? And you will not need a gun or a ski mask. It'll be awesome, right? Okay, please don't do that. <laughs> okay. Um, another interesting thing that we have to integrate with is caller ID systems. So, if you've ordered pizza from your local pizzeria by phone, I know you guys don't use the phone anymore, but some people still do. They also watch Matlock, right? So they call up the pizza place, and after two or three times, they know who you are, right? They, they might confirm your name, but they know what you ordered last time, they know where you live, they know if your check's bounced, they know all that stuff. And the reason that they do it is because they have one of these boxes sitting back there. There's a company in Atlanta that makes these, and they're very weird. Um, and you basically have an analog phone line that comes in the, the back and there's ethernet or serial that comes out the other side. And so what happens when the phone rings in this environment is uh, the, the box decodes the analog caller ID frame, turns it into a UDP packet, and then broadcasts that UDP packet over the network. So in order to simulate that, we don't really have to have one of these boxes. We just have to figure out what that UDP packet looks like and recreate it ourselves. And so that, gr that same gray box tool that we use to simulate printers, we use to simulate uh, caller ID events. And so that's been very, very helpful because one of the, mo the more serious problems that we had early on was making sure that the caller ID response, because it's hard to set up a test for that. It really is. So it's something that kind of didn't get tested a whole lot because it was hard to set up a physical environment to test it in. Now there are some things that are just hard, right? Uh, one is chip cards. So um, we do support EMV devices, external card readers, but it's difficult to have automation around this. Some of the, the the credit card processing industry is, I'll put it politely, is a little behind the times. So um, we're kind of subject to what they're willing to do. Uh, some of them have test gateways where they can give us a little API somewhere in the cloud that can pretend to be this box, right? And we can have some simulation events for that. Most don't do that. The ones that do it, it doesn't really work the same way the real thing does. And we're kind of stuck here. This is an area where manual testing is our only option right now. But uh, we're thinking of buying a robot. So. Um, it's one of those things where we kind of said, you know, if we were being really, really snarky and we just wanted to get ourselves in trouble and have people yell at us, let's start suggesting robots. And we thought, you know what, this is probably how we'd have to do it. So if we have a bunch of these uh, Verifone and Ingenico devices on a bench somewhere, a rack full of credit cards, then theoretically we could, put, we could write something that would connect to our framework that could, that could talk to the robot and tell it where to move and which card to grab and where to swipe it and all of that. So, Maybe next year we'll have that to show you guys. We'll see. So, um, so that's, in a nutshell, what we did. Um, I don't have a big inspirational uplift message at the end. I'm sorry. I have a little bit of that, but not a whole lot. Um, but to kind of summarize, so we had to build 
we had to test two products at once, uh, once essentially, which is difficult. And so we built this product agnostic abstraction later, and then we built a lot of cool, um, a lot of cool simulation tools to make it work. Now, let me let you know how this all worked out in the end. I think that's the most important part. So. First of all, we use cross-functional teams. So our SDETs, our SQEs, well, there were just one, and it's Muheat right here, but now it's expanding a little bit. Um, they're integrated with the teams they're working in, right? Um, so it's not like there's a big, giant QA team way over here that never talks to the core product team. They really are working together all the time. Uh, Muheat and the SQEs, they have the ability to make changes to the core application code to make it easier to test. If they want to add an attribute to the DOM to make it easier to not have to use that XPath expression, then they do it, right? And so um, I, I feel like in test automation, XPath is a code smell. XPath means that, that your team is not willing to confront the problem of not working together, right? And it is usually a symptom of, of, of a management mentality that software testing is less than core development, right? So, if you're being forced to use XPath, you need to start a rebellion. That's what I'm saying, right? What we ended up doing, uh, a couple of things, but we actually added an attribute called data test ID so that we don't even have to tie the test code to the DOM. We can always overload on, the, we can always use the IDs that the developers give these objects. Usually they don't change, right? But um, the data test ID is even better. And so how this actually worked in practice? Um, at this point, we have coverage for the core data entry workflow and most of the credit card processing variations Cards can be declined, they can be partially authorized, there can be gift cards, there's lots of weird things. So um, we're still in the process of building out that command syntax to ex fully express everything. But at this point, I think we've covered most of the highest risk things, and it actually does work. That's the amazing part. So um, every so often, we, uh, the whole point is to catch regressions, right? So you don't ship bad stuff, and it actually has done that. So, um, so nothing ever goes as awesomely as you think it will when you first hatch the idea. Um, and it's always a lot more work, uh, but it is working. And I think that the, the, most, um, the most telling uh, evidence of the fact that it's working um, are in ways that I didn't really expect. I mean, first of all, we've expanded this into our wine division. So we're using this same technology to test our wine software now. And um, completely unsolicited the other day, I was in a budget meeting, and someone that, that I work for suggested to me that we spend more money and hire more people to do this. Now, when management comes down off the mountain and says, hey, I like that, let's put more money on it, that's, that's usually not what we're used to, right? We're used to begging for things because they don't understand any of this. And so they just kind of listen to us and say, okay, well, if that'll shut you up, here it is. Like, but in this case, um, even though I personally would like to see this have made a much bigger impact than it has, the fact that our management is willing to invest in expanding it and getting more and more test coverage uh, is a huge sign that it's working, right? So, I'm very excited about that. I think there's even a decent chance that sometime in the next year they're going to write a check to buy me a robot. Very excited about this. So, um, I know it was a lot to digest. I just kind of wanted to dump it all out there and give everyone some food for thought. Um, I wanted to acknowledge briefly the team of people that basically built this. Um, I think most of the work was done by Mohit Bustakim here. He's the kind of the core um, SDET that uh, built most of the initial stuff, and then we've got new people coming on. And then a lot of QA analysts that basically just, you know, basically explained, hey, all those tacit latent business rules that were hidden in the code, how we had to kind of bring them to the surface and start writing real uh, tests for them. As a, and again, I'm going to put my contact information up here. But as you'll notice, I am not a consultant, right? So no matter how much you enjoyed this speech, you can't pay me $10,000 a week to teach you about Scrum, right? It's not going to work. I'm not set up for that. So um, that's all I had. I, I, how much time do we have? About 12, so we have a little bit of time for questions if anybody has any. I wanted to leave a little time, so I rushed through it. Yes, sir? Do you also test and quantity? Well, I mean, that's another thing that's tied into those physical devices, the Verifone and Genico machines. So yeah, we do test it, but we don't have a way to do it in an automated way yet. As a matter of fact, uh, it was mentioned earlier that we're going to need, need, need iPhones and Android phones as part of the whole robot situation at some point. So, so uh, not, we're, we're, that's the part that you know, and another area that we really can't test yet is fingerprints. So uh, we have fingerprint authentication, and we may have to figure out, is there some kind of prosthesis that we can come up with that the robot can pick up? And you know, that's crazy stuff, right? So we're not there yet. Do you have one too? Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts about setting up a DSL to test something at a higher level? Because I have seen a couple of cases where that could potentially be abused into loading your test infrastructure. 
I think, I think it's possible. Um, I think you want to keep it as flat as reasonable. In our case, we didn't really think about doing another abstraction layer. If anything, the worry was that, well, yeah, you know, it's one thing to say that you have the same test logic that's going to run against two different systems, but there, there are going to be subtle differences. What happens if we change the way one system works on purpose, right? It's a new feature. And so we have to figure out how we deal with those things. So yeah, I'd, I'd try to keep, I, I think it's worked for us because we're small. You know, most of the companies you work for, your lawn, your lawn care budget's more than our whole engineering budget, right? So uh, it's, uh, we try to keep it as simple as we can. And we almost feel like we have to apologize for building a test infrastructure that's elaborate because we are so small, such a small team. We don't have the resources a lot of you have. And so we've had to, you know, really, but, but it, it speaks to the investment in quality. Even if you don't have a lot of money, if you invest in quality, you ship good stuff and your customers come back and they don't get upset. And in our case, where we are small, you know, a, a, a small, what would be a, a, a rounding error in your financials could kill us, right? So we, we, we take it pretty seriously. Who's next? Your sir. Um, this is obviously just black box testing. Yep. Have you extended your framework to white box testing, uh, unit testing, or, or subsystem testing? Does any of this help with that? Well, I mean, you could. Those, those command handlers could do anything. They don't have to just do Selenium type things. Right. They could do anything you want, really. Um, and to, to some degree, we do that because, for example, the printer simulation stuff, the, what we call, we call it gray box because it's kind of a dirty version of white box and gray box and black box testing. Um, so we do that to some degree, but we haven't, again, we haven't really thought about this as, you know, we're going to build some kind of test framework that all of you can go home and use, right? Because I feel like that would distract us from our core mission of testing our product. And it's probably better for people like you to take some of the ideas you like and discard the ones you don't and build your own kind of thing. And we promise not to sue you unless you, you make pizza POS software. <laughs> Who's next? You, sir. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the browser farm that you're using? Are you using Sauce Labs or some other service? We're not using Sauce Labs. We're using a physical browser farm. And the reason is because we ship our customers actual hardware, usually touch dynamic machines. And so we wanted to test it. Now, we're, when we get more into testing the the online ordering side more aggressively, and we really want to have lots of cross-browser, cross-device, we will get into something like that. But right now, it literally is a, a touchscreen machine sitting on a table in Dallas with a cash drawer, which doesn't open, but it's there. Um, and then we have a Windows box, a Linux box, a little Mac mini, and we run, right now, a Bamboo agent on those boxes to, to run them. So, and the reason is because we have noticed over the years weird little quirks. Now, as a web developer, I've never, I've never really thought of hardware-specific problems before cropping up, but they do, right? They happen. And so we wanted to test this stuff on the actual hardware our customers use, not some hypothetical abstraction of it. So that's the reason. But we will grow into something like Sauce Labs eventually. Who's next? No one? Uh, yes and no, I mean, because they are, in our case, they're cross-functional. So the, dev, the QA people are on the dev team. And the reason for that is to prevent, you know, hierarchy from forming between QA and, and core development, right? Um, so, um, I mean, they were just tightly integrated. It, they, they, yes, it was concurrent. The developers that worked on the uh, test stuff were focused on that. Um, and other developers were focus, focusing on the core product. But they worked together. There was a lot of informal communication. Um, the the SDETs and the or the SQEs can they can they can commit changes to the to the core products for to change the DOM to make it easier to test that sort of thing. So um, I think something this ambition something this ambitious if you had the kind of institutional barriers to collaboration that often exist, it'd be very very hard, right? Um, because the, the problem with with test automation too is, you know, it it can't really justify itself unless the product's broken. Do you know what I mean? And so uh, it's kind of like well. In order for this to be worth the investment, we're going to have to show a lot of problems. But that means we have problems. And so now we're hoping we have problems. Right? So, but luckily we did. So it was OK. <laughs> All right. Who's next? Any questions about my vampire romance stories? Nobody? <laughs> I didn't really write any of those. How did it go with uh, your 
So you, I'm assuming you wrote your tests against your legacy software. And yes. Calibrate metrics or just pass fails and then make sure that everything that passed here passed here. Yeah, it's pretty much pass fail at this point. Um, we've kicked around the idea of doing. Um, of essentially letting a, a test fail when when its when its runtime passes a certain threshold of historical norms, but that's unit testing. That's not really part of all this. So, and we could integrate that with anything that's JUnit based, whether it's our normal because our new product is all test driven development and service oriented, and we can we can we can do a lot of the business logic testing without needing to go through the UI to get there. But with the old product, we had no choice because it was PHP, awesome language. We should keep using it. Everyone agree? Okay. Right. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it.